Good morning and welcome to Brushy Creek, where our purpose is offering hope and building community. We do that through our plan to worship, grow, serve, and go. I'm Carly, and before we start worship today, here's some exciting news about upcoming events. Next weekend, the Brushy Creek Choir and Orchestra will present Christmas Joy. The concert will take place on Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. No tickets are required, and we have invitations at the information desk if you want to grab some and hand them out to friends to join us. The week leading up to Christmas is packed with life group and ministry Christmas parties. And then on Christmas Eve, we have two services at 9 and 10.30 a.m. Life groups will not meet, including Brushy Creek Kids. Child care will be available for children three and under. We hope everyone got a chance to look at plans for our 2024 renovation project. Pastor Corey and those involved will meet with members who have questions tonight at 5.30. And next weekend, we'll vote on moving forward with the project during morning services. A reminder to use the QR code in front of you as a quick link to today's bulletin and to keep track of all of our holiday activities. Thanks so much for joining us. And now, let's turn to worship. Good morning, brothers and sisters. We are here this morning to give God the glory, to worship in spirit and truth. Stand to your feet, brothers and sisters. Look at someone this morning and say, I am glad you're here.
morning, church family. My name is Robert. I'm one of the worship pastors here at Rushy Creek, and we are excited today to celebrate through baptism. Amen? Amen. Y'all excited for today? This is Allie and Matt Hussman, a dad and a daughter who both have put their faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, and they come to publicly profess their faith in Jesus today. There she is. Allie, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. Amen. Well, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in death, and raised to walk in newness of life. And this is Matt Hussman, and he's put his faith in Jesus. Matt. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Amen. Well, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in death, and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. What a celebration to start off this morning. A father and a daughter coming to the Lord Jesus, confessing it. What an exciting time in the life of our church. We're so glad you're here this morning. I'm Pastor Corey, and I want to say welcome. As you can tell, we are in the Christmas season, the Advent season, as we celebrate the coming of the Lord. And so we're glad to do that together. And thank you for coming out uh, today and braving the elements along the way, right? Uh, you'll, be, uh, uh, you'll be proud to know that the weather is clear in the sanctuary, all right? Uh, and so we're, we're glad to do that. You saw in our announcements uh, earlier uh, in the video, but I want to make you aware. Ne- last Sunday, we presented to you our renovation plan. Tonight, we are having a Q&A, but I, I kind of tongue-in-cheek hope there aren't any questions because I hope I do a good job explaining everything tonight to you in a little more detail. Uh, so if you want to come back and hear some more, if you do have a question, some of you have asked me some really good ones, and so I have some ways to answer those already. Last week I did tell you that we were having a little bit of issue at the last minute and that Benji, our executive pastor, would be in meetings and figuring that out. And they did figure it out and they did work through it. Uh, and ultimately it just boils down to you're sitting in a 30-year-old building and we're trying to put brand new technology in it. And there's some electrical issues which are going to cause the price to be a little bit. Uh, but our finance team, everybody's good with it. So we figured it out. Uh, we solved it. Benji got on the phone and you'll be surprised at the language he used. It was so godly and good <laughs> and right. Uh, but we figured it out. So we, we can talk more about that tonight. But I wanted you to know we, we have worked through that and we figured it out. Uh, and, and, and so we're moving forward in that way. And so tonight at 530, if you want to come back and just hear some more about that, you're welcome to. Next Sunday, we will ask you to vote uh, to go forward with this renovation and project. And then also, I have one more announcement, particularly aimed at this crowd, this service. January the 7th, we're beginning a new life group. Our church is growing. We're adding to our number. And so beginning January 7th, in the second hour, which is following this service, uh, we're launching a new life group. And it's targeting 20 to 30-year-olds. Uh, And so we have several 20 to 30 year olds that have been coming to this first hour and we want to offer a life group for them. Doesn't matter your marital status. Some of the folks that are starting the class are married, some are not. Uh, So January the 7th, new life group for 20 to 30 year olds. You you say, Pastor, I'm 31. We'll sneak you in. Don't worry. All right. Uh, But that's a new life group that we're going to be launching January the 7th. So we want you to be a part of that. Uh, as well. As we continue to worship this morning as a church family, we always pray together. And there's one thing that I'm always mindful of in the Christmas season is that the Christmas season is joyful, it's fun. I mean, you can get away with wearing tacky sweaters, right? Like it's a great time of year, but there's also pain involved when we think about those that are missing and families that are hurting and all those kind of things. And so, would you just join me for a moment as we just pray together as broken people who love the Lord and know He loves us? Father, We just want to say thank you uh, that in this season you've watched over us, you have loved us, you've taken care of us. And Father, we know that this season there is great joy. Uh, Our radio station changes to a whole different songbook. Uh, We wear festive colors, we have parties, and Lord, it's just a good thing. and We're excited about it. Uh, But Father, we also know that, that in this season there can be hurt and pain. The absence of loved ones, the struggle of families, Lord, we we are mindful of that. You're mindful of that. And Lord, we're just so thankful that even in the midst of the hard days, you are with us. So Father, I just pray a special prayer right now uh, for those in the room who 
uh, this time of year, while it is full of joy and hope because of Christ, can bring some pain. There can be some scars. There can be some longing for the new earth and the new heaven. So, Lord, I just pray your comfort during this season. I pray your spirit would just lift hearts and eyes to you. That even when we think about the pains of this world, it is this very season, the coming of the Savior, that has come to answer those pains. We thank you for that. Father, we ask that you be honored today in the worship of your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are Rick and Deb Banks, and we light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. And today, we light the candle representing peace. From Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. The light of the world is Jesus. Let's pray. Eternal God, through long generations, you prepared a way for the coming of your Son. And by your Spirit, you still bring light to illumine our paths. As we gather to worship you now, renew us in faith and hope so that we may become, we may welcome Jesus to rule our thoughts and to claim our love as Lord of lords and King of kings to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God in her is who he says he is, for he's not. We know that he is. And we know that he sent his son Jesus. He came upon that midnight clear. So as you sing about this song now, as you think about the truth of Jesus, the truth of the word of God, and the principles and promises contained in it, let's sing. It came Oh uh -huh. 
for this holiday season, Father, and we pray now as our pastor brings your word to bear on our hearts, Lord, that those that need a fresh word, be it encouragement during a time of sadness, living a life in sin, or anything that you can help us with, God, we pray that you would touch our hearts and minds this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, let me invite you to take it out and turn with me to Colossians. Colossians, found in the New Testament. We continue our series, our, our time in this call of Advent, this uh, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are looking at these different words that we associate with Advent, the reason why Jesus came, hope and peace and joy and love and so we're we're thankful for um, being able to celebrate these words together uh, and so as you turn to Colossians today we look at the idea of peace and we're thankful for that we're thankful for the privilege of it y'all give me just a second something's ringing up here did that fix it did that fix it hello one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven did we fix it yeah how do I sound majestic powerful is that, is that okay? All right, thank you. I think that mic was on and, oh, wait. Oh, well. I'll just preach loud. You listen good. Don't worry about the other stuff, all right? Uh, so in Colossians 1, now when you think about it, as we approach Christmas, 
We're approaching this season where we have songs and hot chocolate and s'mores and it's perfectly acceptable to wear a reindeer hat or a Santa Claus hat anywhere you go. Like it's a, it's a Yuletide type of celebration. You're going to have time with family and you're going to have time with Christmas presents and there just seems to be this wave of joy that fills the air. I mean, when you ride down the road and see lights twinkling, you feel good about it. But one of the things that we must always contemplate when we think about Christmas is that Christmas is less about Yuletide from a biblical perspective and more about a war. You see, Bethlehem is more like Gettysburg or Normandy than a Norman Rockwell picture. We think of shepherds and a swaddling baby and an angel and the stars, and there's great joy in that. There's great beauty in that. There's beauty in the Christmas pageants. There's beauty in children singing Christmas songs. But we must be reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, left the beauty, the sanctity, and the safety of heaven in order to enter into a war, a battlefield. In fact, the Bible will tell us that in Genesis chapter 3, that man had sinned and rebelled against God, and now we are separated from him. We are under the penalty of death, the slave of sin. We are bound to our God of this earth, little g, Satan, and we are in need of rescuing, and this cosmic war has been going on since the world was created. Since the Father and Satan and the Son and the Holy Spirit had the battle in the cosmos, we find ourselves in the midst of this war, and here is the issue of the war we're losing. Left to ourselves, we cannot win the war, we cannot find peace with God, we cannot be reconciled from our sin. We are in the battle and we are losing, and Christmas... Christmas is about a God who loves his creation so much that he sends a warrior, a savior. He sends one who will come and win the battle, will destroy the enemy, will free the slaves. Christmas is about God bringing peace for us. This is the picture of the story of Jesus. We are enemies of God. Romans 8 would describe us in this way. Romans 8, verses 7 through 8 would tell us, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We are enemies of God left to our own selves, left to our own devices. When we think of Christmas, we must think about our problem. We must think about the sin that we carry. We must think about the chasm between us and God. We must contemplate why Jesus came. Jesus did not come so we could recreate the Christmas story and have beautiful pictures of our children. Jesus did not come so that we could enjoy eggnog and present swapping. Jesus did not come so that dads could get more useless ties and socks. Just seeing if you're awake. Thank you for laughing. Jesus didn't come for that reason. Jesus came because there was a war at hand. Jesus came because there was a battle. Jesus came because of our sin and our depravity and our separation from God. In fact, A.W. Tozer would write this. He would say, until we believe that we are as bad as God says we are, we can never believe that he will do for us what he says he will do. We are that bad. We were losing the battle. We were without peace, without hope. And God enters into the battlefield in very fleshly form. This is the beauty of the Christmas story, that God has come for us. You might ask yourself, well, how do you know that the battle was so bad? Listen to me as I read to you part of the Christmas story found in Matthew chapter 2. This is the response of Satan and his minions to the birth of Jesus. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise man. You don't think Christmas was a war? Satan sends his dominion, Herod, to kill all the babies that are men under two, trying to stamp out the Messiah before he's even born. Christmas is because we are at war with our sin and a chasm between us and God, and we are in desperate need of peace with the Creator. And God sent His Son. 
Christmas is about a hero who stepped on the battlefield. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, and I will confess to you as your pastor, I've been your pastor now getting close to two and a half, three years, and we've probably looked at this passage more than any other passage in the Bible. It is referred to as the hymn of Christ. It is the centerpiece of the doctrine of the theology of who Christ is and what he has done. All believers should find in their Bible Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse 15 and they should circle it. They should hold it. They should lift it high. Because in this passage, here's what we will find. We will find who Jesus is. Who is this babe in a manger? Who is this one sent from heaven? Who is this child that Mary will hold and swaddle? Who is this one that the shepherds will seek and the kings will try to destroy? Who is this Jesus? But not only that, in First Corinthians, or excuse me, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, not only will we learn who this Jesus is, we will learn what this Jesus has done. And because of who he is and what he has done, we can have peace with God. This passage, brothers and sisters, is rich and deep and beautiful, describing for us the very purpose of Christmas. Join me in 1 Corinthians chapter, 15, or chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things are held together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to you in all creation, under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that you can help us learn from your text who you are and what you have done. Father, we pray now as we study your word, as we look at your scripture, as we see the reason why you entered the battlefield, as we understand that it's, uh, Father, you came to rescue us, to give us peace. Lord, that we were in sin and separated from you. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you will show us from your word why you came and why this peace is obtainable and why, Father, you love us so much. Father, we thank you that you have sent your son and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great prophecies of Jesus is found in Isaiah chapter 9 where it says, and he shall be called the Prince of Peace. He has come to bring peace. Part of the reason we celebrate Advent is that he's brought us hope and peace. And so today we gather under this idea of peace and in this text we will see how Jesus can bring us peace, how Jesus can rescue us from our uh, sadness and sorrow and brokenness, how he can pull us in and how he's ransomed this, how he's made it. One of the themes that we find in scripture is creation and recreation. That God has created all things and that sin has broken those things and that God through Christ is recreating all things. And in this text we find it. And so this morning I want to show you two truths about Jesus and why he came. I want to show you how you can have peace with God because of Jesus Christ and his coming to earth. Why the Christmas story is about God bringing us peace. Truth number one, because of who Jesus is, we can have peace with God. Look with me at the text. Let me walk you through how the, how the, the poem of Jesus in these per, verses will tell us this. Uh, look there at what it says. There is a claim that is made. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Now there, Paul is setting for us a theological question. Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. God. What does the word invisible God here mean? What does the image mean? What does this look like? Well, the word has two meanings and they're both being used here. The first meaning means to be a reflection of or a symbol of. It's like if you were to drive out west to South Dakota and stare up at Mount Rushmore, you will see an image of or a symbol of former presidents of the United States. If you were to reach into your pocket and pull out a coin, you will see on that coin the image of someone. It is a representation of. It is a showing of. 
love. It is a reflection in the mirror to show you what you are looking at. When we say image, we are saying that Jesus is showing us who God is, but the word means more than that. It means more than a reflection in a mirror for the person reflecting in the mirror is not the person. For the stone carving of the mountain is not the person. So it means even more than that. The Greek word here not only means this statue or this image, but it also means this full manifestation. It means the very presence of. So when Paul says he is the image of the invisible God, he is literally saying he has brought God into view for us. He has brought us God in the flesh. Can you think about this for a moment? We talk about this every year at Christmas, but it is mind-blowing and baffling and confusing and glorious all in one. Mary was holding God in her hand. What a powerful thing. I've had three children, or excuse me, let me correct that. My wife has had three children, and I've held them as babies. And about five minutes into holding them, I realize this ain't God right here. And, and, and as they grow up, it's even more clear that it ain't God, right? She held God. He came to us. This is the picture of this. He is the image of the invisible God. He is God to us, the visible expression of God himself. How do we know this theologically? Listen now, let me help you understand this doctrine of the Trinity and God in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 18, Jesus said, he has made him known, God, to us. Jesus would also say, John 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The writer of Hebrews would tell us he is the very radiance of God. We know that God can bring us peace because God came to bring us peace because Christ is God in the flesh. Brothers and sisters, listen to me now. You need peace with God. You need a hero. You need a rescuer. And the only rescuer or hero that will bring you peace with God is God himself. You cannot bring peace. You cannot win the war. The battle is not conquerable by you or me or our feeble hands or our educational attempts or our financial blessings. It is only brought by God himself. He is God in the flesh. Richard Mellick would write it this way. In Christ, the invisible God becomes visible. We see God in the flesh. But I want you to notice something else in this verse. Look there in verse 15. Not only does he make a claim about who he is, he is God in the flesh. He makes a claim about his rank, of his status over creation. Listen to what it says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. If the first clause is his relationship to God the Father, the second clause is his relationship with the created world. But notice the phrasing here, because for us, it does not make sense in the way it's written. It says he is the firstborn of all creation. Uh, some of you in here this morning have siblings, and you are the firstborn. I have an older brother. He was the firstborn. I praise God for my older brother. My parents had him and knew immediately, we better try again, and they got me. Now, he says that same joke, and usually he finishes with, when they had Corey, they knew, dear God, we better quit, right? <laughs> but firstborn for us usually means chronological order, but that's not how the text is being used. When it says firstborn, it is talking about rank. It is talking about uh, importance. It is talking about standing. So it literally says that Jesus is over all things. He is the first among everything. He is the highest among all. There is no one above him. He is over creation. He is over all things. He is first. We know that he's not a God, some God, one of the gods. We know that there aren't many gods. We understand this even from reading John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not the first son, the only Son. So the text tells us that Jesus is God in the flesh over all things. This story's getting really good because the hero's resume is building really well. This hero is not like anyone else. He is God in the flesh, ranking over all things. All creation is under him. We see his relation to this. And, the, and now the question is, is, can you prove it? Well, look at verse 16. Can you prove this about Jesus? Well, notice what the writer says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him, all things are held together. Can I prove it? Yes. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Notice how it describes Jesus. It says, first and foremost, that he is uh, the creator of all things. Verse 16, for by him all things are created. Now we know that God alone is the creator. This is the scripture's way of telling us of the Trinity. That God the Father, the architect of creation, and God the Son, the very muscle of creation, are working together as one God to create the world. That Jesus is over all things because he is the maker of all things. But not only is the creator of all things, notice what it says in the text. It says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible. This is somewhat of hyperbole and somewhat of fact. There are things we can see and things we cannot see. If you can see it, Jesus made it. If you can't see it, Jesus made it. He made it all. He is over all. Now notice what it says. And through him all things are held together. Not only did he make all things, he's holding all things together. Again, let us go to the Christmas story and have our minds blown away for just a moment. The very baby that Mary is holding, he fashioned her womb. The very baby that Mary is holding, he made her hand. He allowed himself to be held by the very creation he made. What a gracious and kind God that he would enter into our world. This is the beauty of the Christmas story. This is the beauty of God with us. All things are under him. All things are over him. Everything is in his purview or control. There is nothing outside of it. And might I just add this side note? This means that we serve a God who did not create the world and disappear. He did not create the world and clock out. He did not create the world like chess pieces on a board and then let the computer play out the game. He is a God who is attentive. He is caring. He is watching. He is holding all things together. And brothers and sisters, hear me now. He is watching you and he loves you and he's holding you together and he's sustaining you and he cares about you. And there is no place you can go where Jesus Christ is not in control. Is doing this for us. This is the baby in the manger. Notice what the text says, for unto him all things were created. It's all made for his glory, for his goodness, for his joy. And look at verse 18, or excuse me, verse 17. Look what it says in verse 17. And he is before all things, which means he is not created. Jesus did not come into existence In the barn, the stable, the spare room with animals in Bethlehem. He has always been. He will always be. In fact, he he did not stop being God by entering into our world, but yet he took on flesh. He became fully man and fully God. He added flesh to his godness and he entered into our world. Does this not blow your mind? That the God of all creation would look around this world. Just imagine surveying the headlines of today. That the God who is peaceably sitting in heaven, ruling over all things, and sees every broken thing about this world, including your heart and my heart, and he decides, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to fix it by joining them. What a compassionate God. What a, you know why this is good for me? Because, brothers and sisters, we could take a piece of paper and a pen, or might I say reams of paper, and we could pass it around the room, and we could list problem after problem after pain after sorrow. And here's what I would say to you. Every single one of those details, my God cares about because he sent his son to enter into the battlefield. He's watching and over all of this. This is the Christ of Bethlehem. God in the flesh. We can have peace with God because of who he is. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection from the dead. He is the start of the new creation. He is the beginning of the reconciliation. There is no peace with God if there is no hero to bring us peace. And the only hero that can bring us peace is God himself in the flesh. This is the babe in the manger. 
This is the beauty of the child that Mary holds to her breast. This is what God has done. Look at verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. You want to know how you can have peace with God? you got to have a hero, and the only hero is God himself. This is the story of Christmas. Uh, I don't have peace with God because David killed a giant. I don't have peace with God because Moses brought us Ten Commandments. I don't have peace with God because Peter was a good preacher or Paul was a good writer. I don't have peace with God because John was a faithful martyr. I don't have peace with God because Billy Graham was a good preacher or Spurgeon was a good writer. I only have peace with God because the hero entered our world and the hero is God himself, Christ in the flesh. We have peace with God because of who he is. But the story gets even better. We have peace with God. And I'll give you the second truth this morning. And I'm going to bless you this morning. There's only two points to this sermon. Now, there are 45 minutes of peace, but there's only two points to this sermon. Because of what Jesus has done, we can have peace with God. Not only of who he is, but what he has done. Look there in your text at verse 20 through 22. Listen Listen to this hymn of Christ as Paul is building this case. This is God. What did God do for us? Verse 20, and though... Um, and uh, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, making peace, there it is, peace by the blood of the cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in the body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. There's the war, there's the battle. There's the reason why Jesus came. There's the peace that we need. A war was happening. A battle was going on. This cosmic war between good and evil, heaven and hell, sin and holy God. And we are slaves to the losing team left to ourselves. And then God enters the battlefield through the babe and the manger. And he doesn't just enter the battlefield and walk around. He enters the battlefield and goes to war. Notice the beauty of the war. The beauty of the war is that he has in mind peace for what? Notice there, look with me at verse 20. And through him to reconcile to him all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Notice the phrase there, reconciling to him what? All things. Brothers and sisters, listen to me now. When Jesus enters a war, the war is going to be over. When Jesus enters the war, when God takes on flesh, when God enters in, the war is over. Now, I understand we look around right now, you look around in your life, you look around in your family, you look around at the prayer list that you have, you look around at the world's wars happening around the world and the evil, and you think to yourself, where is peace, where is peace, where is peace? Listen to me. We go to the doctor, they prescribe for us a medicine, we swallow the medicine, and in that moment, we are healed, but it takes a little while for everything else to catch up, doesn't it? It works along the way. God has won the war. God has won the battle. And the peace is permeating. And there is coming a day where Jesus Christ will not come again as a babe in a manger. But he will come again as a soldier on a horse with a sword and make all things new. And so he says in the text, I have entered into your world to make peace on all things. Christ is the answer to peace in all things. He's the answer to peace in your heart and in your soul, in your sin dilemma. He's the answer to peace when you fear death. He's the answer to peace in your marriage. He's the answer to peace in your home. He's the answer to peace to your prodigal sons and daughters. He's the answer to peace to the world around us. As we sing often, Jesus is the answer for the world today. And how do I know this? Because we also sing that Christmas hymn, as far as the curse is found. Wherever you find the curse, the answer is Christ. Wherever you find the problem, the answer is Christ. He says in the text, making peace, all of it, the scope of peace, he has come. And not only is the scope of peace for everything, but then he says that Jesus has done this by death. Notice with me verse 20 again. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. Now notice how he made the peace. By the blood of the cross. The battle was his death. The war was his wounds. The victory is an empty tomb in Israel. This is what he's done. He he stepped in for us. He went to war for us, and he won the battle by laying down his life. And make no mistake, brothers and sisters, 
He did not die on the cross because the Roman soldiers were stronger than God in the flesh. He did not die on the cross because the Jews were more cunning than God in the flesh. He did not die because his disciples were so scared they would not defend him. He died because the Son of Man laid down his life for us. He went to war and he reconciles us by the blood of the cross. In fact, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, the, pro- the writer would tell us this. The apostle would say, he is the propitiation. That means the sacrifice that turned the wrath of God away. That's, that's how you read that word. He is the propitiation for our sin, not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Making peace by the blood of the cross. It is the cross in which brought us peace. It is the glory of God which did it. And we should stare at Christ and think of the cross. We don't ever stare at Christ and stop at a manger. We don't ever stare at Christ and stop with shepherds and a star. We stare at Christ and know that God entered our world in order to fight our battle, to die on our cross, to be buried in our tomb, and raised from a grave we could not be raised from so that we could have peace with God. This is the picture, brothers and sisters. I encourage you this morning. When you see your manger scenes, my wife and I like manger scenes. We collect them from our many travels and missions around the world. We have manger scenes from cultures all over the world. But I'm always reminding our family, I'm always reminding myself, when I see a manger scene, I need to think of a cross. Because that baby came to die for us. Came to reconcile us. In fact, William Barclay would write it this way. He says, if the cross will not waken the love in men's heart, nothing will. This is God in the flesh that came for us, making peace by the blood of the cross. This is how you find peace. You come to Christ. Notice with me the goal of this peace. Look at the the next phrase. It says, verse 21, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, this has now been reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. We were cut off. We were separated. We were losing the battle. We had no hope. We were hostile, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And Christ came and died for us. And notice now what it says about us. Look at the text. Don't miss this. It says, Now you are holy, blameless, and above reproach reproach. Can can I ask you a question? When you woke up this morning, did you feel holy? When you and your wife argued on the way to church, but you put on a fake smile because you were at church and you had to act right, did you feel holy? You remember raising, some of you remember raising kids. You have kids now. Some of the worst battles are on the way to church. You're headed to God's house and you're fighting like you're going to see Satan at his front door, right? Don't feel so holy. Don't feel so blameless. Don't feel so above reproach. But you know what the text says? The text says it doesn't say, well, you're holy when you act holy. You're blameless when you act blameless. So you're above reproach when everything's going well. You know what the text says? The text says that Jesus went to war, died on a cross, was buried. And those who come to Christ, we'll get to this in a moment, verse 23. Those who come to Christ are forevermore in the eyes of God, blameless and holy and above reproach. That means when God looks at us, he does not see our sin and our brokenness and our rebellion. He does not see us on the losing side of the war. He says, this one's with me because of my son and I have peace with them. Brothers and sisters, I promise you, you may not have peace in your home, you may not have peace in your marriage, you may not have peace with your children, your neighbor, or your boss, but I promise you this, the most important place where you need peace is with God himself, and the only way that begins is by coming to Christ who died on the cross. And He says in the text, making peace by the blood of the cross so that you may be holy and blameless, and I love this phrase, beyond Reproach. That means Satan can't say one thing about you. You now have peace with God. Christmas is about God coming to us so that we can have peace with God and one day we will go to him. He descended so we can have peace with God to win the war, to free the slaves so that one day we might ascend to him. God, God did this. God reconciled us. God brought us here. Now I want you to see verse 23. You say, well, pastor, I need this peace in my life. Verse 23 helps us. If indeed you continue in the faith. Now, let us be clear. Paul is not advocating some sort of loss of salvation. He's not advocating for some sort of, well, today I feel like I have the faith. Tomorrow I don't feel like I have the faith. What has happened here? This is not what he's writing to. He's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. 
And this is what he says in verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to you in all creation under heaven, and which I, Paul, became a minister. He literally says this. If by faith you come to this truth that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he will do, and you trust him, and you believe in him, and you walk towards him, giving evidence that you truly trusted him, that you're steadfast saying, my only hope is in Christ. My only answer is in the babe in the manger. My only truth is in the resurrected savior the hero of the story god in the flesh i will look nowhere else i will claim nothing else i have nothing to offer i will cling to christ alone if that is your story if that is your testimony then brothers and sisters listen to me however bad your life may be you have peace with god and in the next life it will be eternal tranquil with our lord in heaven amen and amen, amen. this is the beauty of Christmas so lean in for just a moment let us be reminded of the Christmas story Uh, Mary who is young engaged to be married in Jewish culture the contracts have been made between the families the bride price has been set all the trading has been done an addition to a house is being built so that the family will continue to live together in harmony and in unity And the angel of the Lord, and in the timing of God, she travels to Bethlehem for the census. The Bible says, great with child. That means very, very pregnant. She's traveling along the way, and I'm sure as they're getting closer and closer and closer, she's looking at Joseph saying, Joseph, did you make the reservation? Joseph said, I got a Groupon. I found a good spot in a stable, real cheap. You know the story. There was no place for them in the end. I was reading this this week with my family as we were doing an Advent devotion through the week. And it was interesting, the the writer of the devotion said, you know, God thought of everything. I mean, he picked the right girl, the one who was faithful. He picked the right couple. He he gave them Christ in her womb. He, He fulfilled the prophecy by making sure they would circle back to Bethlehem as the Old Testament tells us that would happen. He said, wonder why God didn't think to make sure they had a room available. And then we are reminded he was born in a barn because he came for the least of us. He came so we could find him. We could approach him. If he's born in a palace, we'd never get through the gate. He's born in a barn. He's reminding that God took on flesh and came to us. And think about it. We we sing about silent night. I've I've been able to witness the birth of three children. There ain't nothing silent about that room. (laughs) Some of you ladies almost got up and got Pentecostal at that right there, right? (laughs) Ooh, preacher, you own it now. In a barn, in a stable, no epidural, no comfortable bed, no nurses and doctors and Lord tabs and Tylenols. In a barn, in the muck and the mud, the God of all creation is born in flesh. You know what you do when you have a baby? You count the fingers and toes, don't you? You start touching the crown of their head and you touch the fingers and the toes and the little pink cheeks and the little round belly. And, and then I am a child of the Lion King, so I held mine up and screamed to the... <laughs> but just think for a moment what, what, what Colossians 1 tells us. This baby in the flesh entering into this cosmic war in which we are losing and enslaved to sin and God wrapped himself in the garments of flesh and entered into the war and he didn't just enter into the war as a casual soldier but listen now don't miss this those hands that Mary counted over and over and over were fashioned for nails. Those beautiful little pink feet were fashioned for nails. That warm, cuddly baby held to her chest would have whips across its back a spear shoved into its side, and that beautiful crown face would have thorns imposed so deeply that blood would run down his body. This baby, this God in the flesh, he 
did not enter into yuletide and eggnog and tinsel. He entered into a war. And he went to the cross and he died. But brothers and sisters, praise be to God. The grave could not hold him. Death could not keep him. Sin did not have a claim on him. And he rose from the grave conquering death, hell, Satan, and sin. And the war is over. God in the flesh, as verse 21 would tell us, brought us peace by the blood of the cross. That's Christmas. That's a lot cooler than reindeer and Santas and them blessed elf on the shelves. <laughs> That's Christmas. A hero stepped in and brought us peace. And I know, I know, it doesn't always feel like peace. Sickness and sorrow and cancer and death and divorce and brokenness and children and problems and wars and kidnappings and terrorists. And it doesn't feel like peace. But Jesus rose from the grave to make us peace with God. So no matter what this world may throw at us, if you know the Jesus of Christmas, then you have a peace deeper than any trial or struggle this place may give you. And one day, brothers and sisters, you will not just have the feeling of peace, you will meet the person of peace face to face. Hallelujah and amen. Let's pray together. Father. We thank you. Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed worshiping with us online. What a blessing technology can be. Today, as you heard God's word preached and as you sang with God's believers, I, I pray that the Lord spoke to you in a special way. In fact, I want to invite you to connect with us even more. Maybe today the Lord is pressing upon your heart a need for prayer. Maybe the Lord is pressing on you that you need to follow him in a more tangible way. Whatever the case may be, whatever the Lord may be saying to you, I, I want you to know that Brushy Creek is here for you, that we want to help you in your walk with Christ. In fact, I want to invite you to contact our church office anytime, Monday through Thursday, 830 to 430. Or you can email the, uh, the address you see at the bottom of the screen and let us know that you worship with us. We'd love to know about you. We'd love to join you in praying for the things that are going on in your life and strengthen your walk. And as always, I want to invite you to come join us in person. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you haven't been able to get out, but now you're ready. We would love to have you as a guest at our church service. Thank you again for worshiping with us. May God bless you.